to another episode of the Studio 78 Podcast. I am your host, Michelle from MichelleSnow.com. Welcome. Oh my goodness. This is episode 95. I'm almost on 100 episodes. Crazy. Remember, you can get all the show notes for this page over at nichesnow.com slash 95. So who do I have on today? I have on Miss Jen Hewitt. She's a printmaker, surface designer, textile artist, all the things, and she's amazing. And we have like an amazing, amazing chat today that I know you guys are going to to love. Anywho, few housekeeping items. Remember, if you haven't already, please rate the podcast five stars. And if you love this episode, please share, share, share. That is how people discover the podcast. So thanks to everybody who's done it already. And if you haven't, and this is your first time here, please take a few minutes to do that. I would really, really appreciate it. And also, you guys, remember to head on over to my website to check out my journal, the Life Cleanse Journal, and my course, which helps you get organized and make time for all of the things you want to do. Okay, so Miss Jen Hewitt, what do we talk about today? Whole bunch of things. But I just want to highlight a couple real quick. One, we talk about the importance of showing up, and you'll understand what I mean in a few minutes when she chats about it. We're going to talk about her two passion projects, and that kind of like launched her creative career. And I just love it. You know, we've talked about passion projects on this podcast before. I mean, this podcast for me is a passion project, right? I'm on episode 95 and I do this because I just love, love, love it. Not because it's helping me pay my mortgage, right? Like I love talking to creatives. I love sharing their stories and I love hearing from you guys how their stories help you, right? And so we talk about the, you know, her passion projects and how they kind of led her to where she is today. And then we um, also kind of take, you know, a side conversation, which was really great where we just, we had like a side conversation where we're talking about how to avoid the comparison trap when using social media and we've all done it before. And so there's like a whole little little section about that that I think you guys will really enjoy. So anywho, I'm going to shut up now and let's talk to Jen. Here we go. Hello, Jen. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Nishé. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. I mean, I love your work. I can't wait for my listeners to check out all the things that you do. Um, But before we like get into that, can you just tell my listeners a little bit about you before you got into illustration, printmaking and being a surface designer? Oh, my goodness. Okay, (laughs) so I jumped. I was just telling a friend about this the other day that I tended to jump careers every four years. So once I got graduated from college, I worked in education for four years, first at an educational nonprofit and then at a school. And then I started a business. I had a stationary business and then that folded because I was too young to be running my own business. And then I went and worked for um, a tech company, an e-learning company, and did that for four years and got laid off. Um, and then from there, I was unemployed for a couple of years, went and worked at another online marketing company, lasted all of five months and decided, you know what, I have this creative life. That was what sustained me while I was unemployed. So I'm going to see if I can explore this and see if I can make this work, but I need a, I need income. So I did HR consulting for another mm, six ish years, um, mm. And I was doing the HR consulting in tandem with really honing my skills as a printmaker and a surface designer. So, yeah, I've I've moved around a lot. I'm one of those people who doesn't have a linear path to anything. (laughs) (laughs) No no worries. So let me ask you a question. Uh, You know, that period where you were unemployed and you said you were kind of making a little bit of money, you know, through your design. What were some of the lessons learned from that period of time? Mm, I think the biggest lesson I learned during that time was, so it was 2008 when I got laid off, the end of 2008, and the economy was bad, and that was the reason I was unemployed for so long. Um, Mm -hmm. People just weren't hiring, and what I did was really niche, and I worked with small businesses, and those were the businesses that were just strapped for cash. So 
I had gotten to the point working a full-time job that I had a little bit of savings and I had no debt and I had very low living expenses. And that was partly what really allowed me to flourish during unemployment. Um, People told me I had the best unemployment they'd ever seen. (laughs) 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 You know, I was getting unemployment. Um, I had a little bit of savings. I didn't have to spend much of anything on anything. And I just went to the studio every free chance I got. So Mm. I I didn't at the time have a studio in my home. So I would go to the community print studio um, and I would just I would print anything and everything. So I started out by printing on paper because it was cheap. That was what I could afford. And, you know, you make mistake on a piece of paper. You just recycle it and use it for something else. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I would just do that. And. I think because, especially with printmaking, it's such a physical activity, you have to build a lot of muscle memory because your hands will start to figure out exactly how much pressure to put onto your squeegee when you're pushing ink through a screen. Um, you know, there's just a lot of movement in it. And so the more you do it, like anything else, but the more you do it, the better you get at it. And also so much of that knowledge is just stored in your body. So you got to keep your body moving and you got to keep, you just got to keep printing. Mm, yes. And then it's interesting, too, because I feel like during that period of time, what it sounds like, too, is you're like, OK, well, maybe I don't need that. You know, I'm just making up something. But Starbucks every day, like, oh, you know what? This coat, I don't need a new coat. I'll wear this coat. Like, it seems like you were very thoughtful about, like, all of your purchases just to make sure that your money was able to, like, really spread out through the years. Oh yeah. I, I, well, also I didn't need anything. If you think about it, you think about how much work, how much money goes into, um, having a regular full-time job. You got to get there. You have to dress for it. You have to either prepare your meals for it, or you're buying lunch every day. You're going and getting coffee with your coworkers. You got to pay your dry cleaning. Um, and then you come home and you're too tired to prepare food. So you order out. So, In reality, Mm -hmm. if you're not working a full-time job, um, or if you're, yeah, if you're not working a full-time job or if you have help or in the home, um, whether that's a a partner who helps out or, you know, you live with family or you're lucky enough to afford someone who can do all that stuff for you, Mm -hmm. um, you, you just naturally spend a lot less money, um, And that was, that was a big revelation too. So now that I work for myself fully, there's very little that I really, I know that I need. There are things that I want, but I can't necessarily (laughs) afford them. So, you know, when you don't, when you don't know where your income's coming from six weeks or six months down the line, you're really thoughtful about how you spend what you've got. Mm. And then I wanted to talk about, so you're like, okay, when you say, you know what, I think I want to do this for myself, but I want to have a job, you know, while I'm kind of learning and figuring this out. Can you just walk the listeners through, like, what are some of the things that you did while you had a job to prepare for that? And then kind of like, when did you know, like, okay, I think I've got this. I think I'm ready to Mm -hmm. work for myself. Yeah. So... Truth be told, I was working a job that I hated. Um, (laughs) That's why I lasted five months there. And it was so, it was so abrasive to me to go in there every day. You know, I was miserable all the time. I hated that Mm. job. Um, I knew I had to get out, but I also knew that I didn't want to go into another full-time situation um, because I just, I couldn't, you know, I, I couldn't do that to myself because I knew that I wanted to be a full-time working artist at some point. So I was really lucky in that um, connections that I had made when I graduated from college and also when I had um, full-time jobs, they had started um, an organic food company and it was growing and they needed someone to come in and help them with their HR. And I had done human resources um, on a smaller scale with a small business and actually had done bits and pieces of recruitment and HR throughout my entire career. It was the one thing that kind of linked everything together. Um, And so they asked me if I would be willing to come and help them. And literally, they offered me four hours a week. (laughs) That was all they needed. (laughs) And I looked at that and I thought, you know, 
I, I feel like I have to take this. At first I said no, cause I couldn't figure out how I'd make it work. And then a couple of weeks later I had, um, I had an, an argument, um, or disagreement with the CEO of the company I was working for. And I thought I have to get out of here. Mm. And so I went back to them and I said, okay, I will, I'll do this. Um, and they said, great. Well, the guy next door also needs help. So maybe you can pick up a few more hours from him. And, um, so I ended up working for him another four hours a week. So suddenly I had eight hours of work a week, which wasn't enough to pay all my bills, but also it was, I still had a little bit of savings. And again, I didn't have that much debt, so I was kind of okay. Um, and then it just quickly skyrocketed. I, Mm. the, the CFO of those two companies was also a consultant and he had a consulting group and he referred me to, one of his clients. Um, and I started working for that client. And so suddenly I had like 20 hours a week. And then, so every time I would meet another consultant at a business where I was working, they would say, Oh, you know, so-and-so I think you'd be really good for so-and-so. And, um, and I would go and I'd meet with them and I'd pick up another six or eight hours. And so it just really built from there. And I think the reason that I ended up being such a good, a good person to do consulting was that I'd worked in these small businesses, um, for most of my career. And Mm. I'd also had my own small business. And so I really understood the constraints of a small business. I wasn't going in and doing HR for IBM, which had a lot of support staff and, you know, everybody, um, in the department has a very specific, narrow focused role. I could come in and just kind of do everything. Um, and that was something that I'd always been able to do was just pitch in and see what needed to be done and just do it. And so I didn't really prepare for it in any way. It was more that I got into these places and I saw what needed to be done and people who I was working with saw that I knew what needed to be done and I was just kind of doing it. And they felt that that was a really valuable quality and started referring me out. So, um, yeah, it still kind of blows my mind that I was able to do that. <laughs> I feel like I conned people for six years. I was like, hey, I'm, I'm going to do your HR, you small business of five people or 120 people. Like, I'm just going to do this. But in reality, I think a lot of it was showing up and knowing how to represent and how to get things done and knowing what questions needed to be asked and what I didn't know. I mean, I think these are all good life skills. Mm-hmm. Um but it was, it was a really good step for me. I'm inter- eternally grateful to those first clients. Um, they're still around. They keep growing. And just because they gave me an opportunity that I wouldn't have looked for myself, um, and they really trusted me to do it, and it, it led to me being able to do what I'm doing now. Ah, so while you were doing that, like, you know, you're picking up more HR clients and you're like, okay, this is gonna, like enough to help me like pay the bills, sort of like I'm doing okay. What were the first types of like, um, design projects that you started to do and sell? Hmm. So I did two different things. One was that I printed a lot on fabric and I sewed those into bags because I just learned how to sew too. Mm. And also it was the early days of Etsy and blogs. So or the heyday of Etsy and blogs. So everybody was, um, selling their stuff on Etsy and, you know, blogs were looking for more content. So it was just a really nice relationship to have. Um, and so I would sell, I would, I would sell the bags on Etsy. I would sell these bags at craft fairs. Um, they would get picked up by blogs. They would start to go viral and, It was great, except I was doing everything on my own. So it's a lot to do everything on your own, like to to do, especially the printing and the sewing. Like I love printing. I also love sewing, but I love sewing for me. Um, And I figured that out pretty quickly. Like, oh, no, I don't want to be doing I don't want to be sewing 100 bags. Um, So I did get help for that. But also it got to the point where I was making enough money from consulting because I live in the Bay Area and there is no shortage of um, small businesses and startups here that need help. So I always had more work than I really wanted to have. Um, Mm. so I didn't need to sell my work anymore, which was a blessing, um, because 
Then I created projects for myself, and I did two. One was called 52 Weeks of Printmaking, um, and I explored a different form, or I did a different print every week for a year. I think that was 2014. And um, I had meant to explore different types of printmaking, so not just block printing and screen printing, but also intaglio and lithography and letterpress. Um, but because I was consulting, I waited until the last minute every single week to do my print. So I ended up like doing block printing, um, super simple prints, um, on a very soft carving medium and just would do that. And it was also, you know, I, I feel like I hit all these points where I was just in the, in the right place at the right time. Um, but it was the beginning of Instagram. So I would post oh, my yeah. stuff on Instagram <laughs> And then I created my own hashtag, which now other people have now taken on this project, which, you know, whatever, it's fine. (laughs) Um, But I had all these prints that I did. Um, And at the end of that year, I had 52 new prints. I had also gotten so many requests to teach that I started teaching. Um, And it just kind of grew from there. And then the next year, I started a project called Print Pattern Sew, which expanded on my block printing experience or skills. And I started, um, block printing what we call yardage. So not cut pieces of fabric, but actual like yards of fabric, continuous yards of fabric that would then get cut and sewn into clothing. Mm. So I did that. And every month I would do a new design, print it on fabric and then sew it into a garment. And that really, that combined all of these things that I love, um, printmaking, fabric, clothing, Um, and at the end of the year, I thought, well, this would be a really good book. So I'm Mm. going to put together a proposal. And so that project led to my book and which is called print pattern. So, and it really was just these projects that I had taken on for the fun of it, that really pushed my career to the next level. Mm. So anybody who's got a full-time job who is saying, well, you know, (laughs) I don't have any time to do this. I really want these things. It's often, it's often a choice you make. Um, you can spend an hour on Instagram or you can spend an hour watching TV, or you can spend an hour on a little challenge that you've set for yourself. And mm-hmm. those, you know, it's for the most part, it's not an excuse. If you are a middle-class person <laughs> with a full-time mm-hmm. job, you know, you can do these things. Um, it's really just an issue of, of choosing how to spend your time. I um, agree. Yeah, because it's it's weird. I always tell people, I'm like, if you have time to watch Netflix or cable or do anything like that, that means you have time to do the thing that you love, you know, because all you have to do is say, like, instead of watching, binge watching the new season of whatever, you could binge create, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and like spend that five hours sewing, block printing, you know, learning how to do calligraphy, but it's all about priorities and what's important to you. And so if you're right, like if there's any loose time in there, there's time to create. (laughs) And I think a lot of people, because they're so invested in social media, and this is where, you know, I've built my career partly on social media, so I don't want to diss social media, but this is where social media is a trap, which is for the most part, people are presenting their best of, and they're presenting their finished products. Mm -hmm. They are not showing you a lot of process and that's fine. Right. But I think when people come home and they're tired and they just, they either want to watch TV or scroll through Instagram or, or they're thinking, well, maybe I should take that calligraphy class when they take that calligraphy class and it doesn't look like what they saw on social media, they will give up. A lot of Mm -hmm. people do that. Yeah. Without understanding that the person behind that account has been doing this. I mean, I know one person who's been doing it since 2004, right? Right. <laughs> and it's 2019. So she's been doing this for 15 years and people show up and want theirs to look like hers after, after a couple of tries. It's not how it works. Um, mm-hmm. But we see on social media, we see on Instagram, everything's pretty, everything's finished, everything's been edited. And I get it. I get into, fall into that trap too, but there's a lot of behind the scenes to get to that point. And if your work doesn't look like that, 
doesn't mean you necessarily turn back and watch like one more season of Orange is the New Black. Like you, you, <laughs> right. you, you, you go back and you keep working on it. No, I tell people that all the time because like I had like, I always have people like, oh my God, Nishé, how do you do your hand lettering? And I'm like, literally two years ago, I took a class on Skillshare and every <laughs> week I find a way to do it, you know, because it brings me joy. So the more I do it, the better I get at it. Like not, I'm not the best at it, but I'm going to be maybe better than a beginner because I've chosen to practice it every week. And I think sometimes people don't get it. They're just like, no, as soon as I try it, it should be perfect. Just like what I saw. <laughs> on Pinterest on Instagram and I'm like no 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 like you you actually have to put like a little time and love into it you know (laughs) right and if you're not you're not as good as so and so you're still better than you were a week ago which is you're you're better than like you know October or August Neshe right you're right (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> and that's what I always tell people because I'm like, of course, I can always I'm going to find a million people maybe on Instagram that do this every single day because they have time to do it every day, all day, or that's their profession. And I might look at them and say like, oh, my God, their stuff is so much better and it's great. But it, it that's when you fall into that comparison trap, right? When instead mm-hmm. of just being like, oh, my goodness, I'm better than I was six months ago, a year ago, two years ago, and I'm getting better and just being happy with like your progress. I, I do think people do have like a real issue with that. Mm -hmm. And I'll be honest, this is a little secret, which I have not said out loud to almost anyone. I actually unfollowed a lot of printmakers that I really admire because seeing their work was making me feel bad about where I was, even though I'm really happy about where Mm -hmm. I am. So that happens to everyone, right? Like these are people I admire and I just, I need to pick and choose when I look at their work. Um, I don't want to see it fed up to me every day and it looks fantastic. And I'm like, (laughs) what am I doing with my life? Because it's just (laughs) comparison is the thief of joy. And I can really admire these people, but I can also know that I, I need to preserve, I need to preserve something of myself, um, and not compare myself to them. And that might mean just not looking at their work for a little while. And that's completely okay too. Mm, I, I'm 100. I'm glad you're saying this. See people, see, listen. <laughs> I know now people are going to be like, wait, what? She unfollowed me. I'm sorry. <laughs> but no, I get it because it was funny. I saw some Instagram post where it said something, I'm paraphrasing, but like you have control of what you want to see. You can unfollow, unfriend. You don't have to like things because if you do realize something is affecting you or maybe even influencing your creativity, Activity, right? You're like, oh, I see someone's doing roses all the time. And all of a sudden you start doing roses. It's like, wait a minute, I'm being influenced by like what I'm seeing every day. And so I feel like, you know, that sometimes you do have to like take a break from social media or not follow certain accounts because then that helps you with your creativity and kind of like your mindset too. So it makes complete sense. Okay, Uh good. I I feel validated now. (laughs) And so you're like doing this HR thing. You are, you know, starting to like get more into this printmaking. And so at, at what point did you say, okay, this is like a thing. Let me continue to expand and do different products. Cause I see like you have like t-shirts and enamel pins and like limited edition prints. And so how did you begin to like diversify the types of things that you were starting to sell to people? Mm. Interestingly, I had was really diversified when I first started out and then I saw what started to sell and I focused on the things that sold and those mm. were printed textiles. And um, I really got people into my printed textiles. That's what I was and probably still am known for. And then, um, and I couldn't, I couldn't sell a print on paper to save my life. Like people would come up to me at shows and say, I really like this, but I have no idea where I'd put it. And then I'd have to buy a frame. And I'm like, I get it. I get it. Okay. (laughs) But they would spend more money on a dish towel that they would have to use and throw in the washer. They would spend more money on that that they would ever spend on a, on a print. Mm. Um, And so for years, I was really just doing work on fabric. Um, And it's only been in the last six months, or it's only really been this year that I've branched back out into doing 
items like prints on paper. And um, I started working with a manufacturer to manufacture my enamel pins. Um, And it was partly because I had gotten a much bigger following because of my book and because of uh, the licensed fabric collection I'd done and because of some other licensing work I'd been doing that I couldn't keep up with the demand of printing and selling all of this stuff myself. So I Mm. needed help. And I decided that the best way to do that would be to start having at least the pins manufactured because those are a lower price point. They're 11 or $12 a piece versus a $30 dish towel. And so it's way more accessible to people. And I decided that I would work with a manufacturer to get those out so that I could at least achieve some level of sales volume that didn't require me to constantly be printing Um, When I would print tea towels, last year I printed a different tea towel every month, and I had subscribers who subscribed to a club, and they got a tea towel every month. Mm. Um, It was eight Mm. days out of the month that went into the design, the setup, the printing, the packing, the mailing. It was at least eight days. And not saying that it wasn't worth it, and I loved doing that project, but also if you're spending eight to ten days a month on one project, you know, how much time have left the rest of the month to work on other things that are going to be a little bit more long-term that don't require you to constantly be present and be creating the work in that such a physical way. So, yeah. So I decided I would do, I would try to diversify and do the pins. Um, I still do some work on fabric and I will be doing a fabric calendar this year, I think, and do some prints on paper, which are quite frankly, much easier for me to do. They don't mm-hmm. require 10 days. Right, <laughs> um, right. <laughs> you know, like they don't have to be heat set. Uh, the, all the paper is the same size. So I don't have to, I don't have to work with different wonky shapes and sizes. So it's just, it's just a lot, it's just a lot easier for me. And I do want to add a few more things onto that, but I'm not really sure what yet. So that'll be a big 2020 project. Yeah, because I was going to ask you, because, you know, I know like a few people who do like the block printing and so forth, but I'm like, you know, it's very labor intensive. So it's like a lot of fun, but I, I could only imagine as your sales, like in the beginning, it's like, oh, this isn't, this isn't bad. But as your sales increase, it's like, ooh, like, how do you, yeah. how do you keep up with it and, and mm-hmm. start to like not lose you know, money also, right? Cause time is money. So I was curious about like, at what point did you say like, oh my goodness, I either need to get help or I need to like slow down. <laughs> well, <laughs> to, to clarify, I only screen print anything I sell. I don't block print the things oh, I sell because okay. yeah. So block screen printing is really good for production work, but block printing, not so much um, because it is so labor intensive. So I only teach block printing so that people can make their own stuff. <laughs> ah, okay. Smart. Yeah. Okay. That's how I was like, yeah. wow. Okay. Cause yeah, cause yep. with, I feel like screen printing, you could do it a little bit faster. Right. I mean, it still takes mm-hmm. time, but okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but there was a point last year where I, I was just doing more and more licensed work and I realized, Oh, Hey, this is where it's at. It's, designing and then licensing the designs to other companies and they handle the production and the manufacturing and the distribution and the sales. So I don't have to have my hand in anything, but handing over the files to them. And I decided, and this is, I think this is really important too. I had gotten to the point where I'd stopped reacting to opportunities and started, and this was very much last year. I started figuring out what I wanted to do long-term and started thinking about ways that I could achieve those goals. And that meant that I had to free up myself from doing a lot of physical labor um, and spend more time doing a lot, a lot of design. So that's been, that was really the big change. It wasn't that anything specific happened. It was more that I thought about my longevity um, and just physically, because my back, I threw my back out a couple of years ago and it's fine. Um, you know, like nobody needs to send me their physical therapy or Pilates <laughs> recommendations because Lord knows I get enough of those. And I'm like, I'm fine. This is why I don't talk about personal stuff online because <laughs> you all are trying to send me advice. Um, 
But I thought about, you know, like if there's just me doing all this work and I don't want to bring on help, how much longer can I do this or how much sense does it make for me to do all of this stuff? So if, if I want to be an artist, um, long-term and I do my plan, my retirement plan is to die. So I will be doing this (laughs) until the day I die. If I can knock on wood, um, how do I pull myself out of the backbreaking work of, of screen printing for five or six days out of the, out of every month? Um, Mm -hmm. and the realization was, well, I just do more and more licensing because I can do that design once and I will receive royalty checks every month or every quarter. And let me tell you, it's really nice every mm-hmm. month to get, go to the mailbox and pick up my checks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I haven't actually had to produce anything but digital files. Like, it's really nice. I didn't have to ship anything. I didn't have to heat set anything. Right. So let's say there's like some artists and illustrators out here that are like, Jen, that's what I want to do. How do I get into this licensing thing? Any advice for them? Like any tips? Because I I think sometimes people are like, oh my goodness, okay, I have this following. I have these ideas. I'm at the point where I want some, you know, recurring income without having to do physical labor. Like how do you, you know, any advice on how do they start to get into licensing? Like things that they need to keep in mind. Oh, so I am the worst person to ask this question of because <laughs> everything has kind of come to me. I am one of those, don't hate me. I'm one of those people who, like I got an email saying, I get emails saying, would you like to design a fabric collection or yeah. So I get, I, I, I get a lot of inquiries about that. Um, mm. and I've never had to go out and do any trade shows. I've never had to get a licensing agent. I've never even taken a licensing class. Um, which is not to say that those things aren't helpful because I think those things are all immensely helpful. And maybe one day I will do one or more of those things, but yeah, I'm not the best person to ask. There are definitely resources out there. There are classes on licensing your illustrations and there are licensing agents. There's a big licensing. There are a couple of big licensing trade shows in New York that people can go to. I think they are Surtex is one and blueprint is another one. And then there's the international licensing show, which is kind of huge and overwhelming because it's really about, um, big name licensees such as hello kitty or Atari or those kinds of things. So Mm. I wouldn't recommend that last one. Those are all, those are all really good resources for folks. And, the other thing I would say, because I get requests from artists who ask me to give them advice, um, mm-hmm. which I never really respond to because I don't have the time to, to respond to everybody. Um, mm-hmm. And again, there are so many resources out there. But I think the first thing is that you really need to make sure that what you are doing is interesting and different. And if you take a look at what's out there and who is successfully licensing their work, and you mm-hmm. can find these artists on Instagram, you can even follow some of the licensing agents. Um, There are two that I know of, Jennifer Nelson and Lilla Rogers, both are licensing agents. But if you look at the artists who they're licensing, it's actually, this is when it's really helpful for you to compare your work to someone else's and to take a look at your portfolio and say, do I have the breadth or the depth of these people? You know, and like I've had people who have two designs that they want to license and I'm like, no, that's not how it works. Right. Um, <laughs> you got to be consistent and show up. And so you really, you know, you've, you've got, you've got to develop your critical eye and you've got to be really critical about your own work. Um, mm. and then I think the next thing that I would say is you got to have a following. Um, and you got to put your work out there regularly. And and I'm not talking about having tens of thousands of followers, but I'm talking about having people who like your work, who are willing to buy the things that you make, um, and who are, who are there for you. Right. Mm -hmm. So, which means that to develop that, you've got to just keep cranking out work and sharing work, um, and not pay attention to the following follower count because, I have been in marketing groups where people have said like, I had 350 followers and then now it's dropped down to 342. What am I doing wrong? It's like, no, just keep <laughs> right. just focus on the work, like right. figure out what it is that you want to do, share that work because you will get the kind of work that you constantly, you consistently put out there. 
Um, and then the mm-hmm. other thing is to start thinking about like, well, how do I ask for licensing deals? If you're really interested in licensing, then you know, you can start putting it out there. Like I would love to license this work or start following the companies who you'd like to work with. Now don't DM them, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but start following them and figure out how you can target them. Mm-hmm. No, that, I think that's great. Great, great, great advice. And then just before I get to the wrap up questions, I just wanted to dig into one more product of yours and you talked a little bit about it, but the book. So is that one of those things like after you, you know, kind of got more and more popular and started to get a fan base that a publisher reached out to you? Did you decide to self-publish? Um, but I'm just curious, like, you know, how you are able uh, to kind of get like your thoughts out there in the, in the book form. Yeah. So I, um, I decided that I wanted to write a book and I didn't want to self-publish it because Publishers are great. They have things like marketing and distribution teams um, Mm -hmm. and art directors. So all you have to do is write the book and shoot the photos. You don't have to do all that other Mm -hmm. stuff. Um, But I knew that I wanted to work with a publisher and that meant that I had to write a proposal. So I put together a proposal um, and craft proposals are different than other book proposals in that you actually, you don't write the book first and then shop it. You shop around the idea, but you have to prove that it's a viable idea, um, that people are interested in the subject matter. And then you also have to prove that you can carry the idea through um, a 25,000 to 45,000 word book. So I shot a couple of projects and I did step-by-step tutorials on how to create those projects. And then I also included information about, um, about who I am and what my what my audience, who my audience is. Um, I talked about the classes that I taught and about this project print pattern. So that the book was based on, and I packaged that all off up and sent it off to a number of editors that I had, um, contact information for, because I have enough friends who've published books in the past that I Mm. can, you know, hit them up and ask them, Hey, would you be interested? Would you be willing to share your contact? Um, now I will say, do not ask that of a complete stranger. Right, <laughs> <right>. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but if you have friends, then definitely ask your friends, um, if, if friends who've published books and a lot of, um, there are a lot of seminars and workshops too on submitting book proposals, but that's a digression. So I sent that out to people that I had contact info for and, um, when you do that, you know, it's not like everybody gets back to you right away. It takes a little bit of time. So I think it was hanging out there for about six weeks when I started getting um, letters of interest or emails of interest saying, hey, we'd like to talk to you more about this. And then right around the same time, completely out of the blue, two publishers contacted me. So oh, wow. <laughs> one, yeah, one was an editor who said, um, I really like this project. Would you be interested in talking about making this into a book. And I said, actually, I already have a proposal done. Um, let me send it to you. I think I'm going to get responses like this week. I think I'm going to get a couple of offers. So I sent, um, I sent her the proposal and then it became clear I was going to have multiple offers, which is a really nice position to be in. So I, at that point I got, I got an agent (laughs) and actually, um, I hadn't gotten an agent up front because I thought I could just do it on my own. But this was an agent who worked, used to work for one of the publishers and said, you know, I no longer work there. But if you're interested in representation, let me know. I'm on maternity leave, um, but I'll be back at X, X, Y, Z time. And I followed up with her and I said, I think I'm going to get a bunch of offers. So if you wouldn't mind, just would you be willing to negotiate the contracts? And so she did. Um, but if you work with an agent, they will work from the beginning, they'll help you with your proposal. But I had had, I'd worked in nonprofits. Um, I'd worked for a marketing company. I knew how to write proposals, so I just can kind of crank them out. So I, I sent one out. Um, but I did get a bunch of offers and I ended up going with one of the editors or one of the publishers who had contacted me versus anyone, any of the people I'd sent the the proposal to. Um, and then after, signed the contract. 
I, another editor reached out to me and said, Hey, I think this would be a really good project. And I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm already signed. <laughs> so, like too late. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. But I think the key is that if you sit around waiting for things to happen for you, happen to you, yeah. instead of doing the work you want to do, um, you're not, it's, it's not going to work out, right? Like you have yeah. to have some, investment in your, you have to have a lot of investment, um, and a lot of motivation to get this stuff done. And if you don't know where to start, then maybe just start by starting, just do some of the work, do the projects you want to do. Don't worry if anybody's paying you for it because they're not going to pay you for it in the beginning. I mean, and I'm not talking about working for free. I'm talking about working for yourself for free. So, um, if you want a fabric line, then figure out, you know, get some of your designs on fabric, do it mm-hmm. on spoon flower, order some yards and see how it looks, tweak it. You know, you're going to need all this stuff for your portfolio, share it online. Um, but I think, Love it. I think waiting around and thinking you're going to get a lucky break, um, it's not helpful. And I've certainly gotten lucky breaks, but I've gotten lucky breaks because I've been doing so much darn work. (laughs) (laughs) Right, right. No, yeah, you've been putting yourself out there. And then question, do you think for your, because I've heard, you know, mixed things from authors. So sometimes maybe it depends on like the industry or what type of book it is. But like some folks are like, no, I, you know, make, make decent money, like, 10% 10% of my income is from my book sales. And then other people are like, well, I make a little bit of money, but where I really got the bang for my buck is more people discovered me, which helped me to like get speaking gigs and get, you know, more sales and so forth. So for you, has the, you know, how has the book helped you? Is it more like, oh, it's another way of generating income or is it more, no, it's given me, um, kind of a, another audience that has, or, you know, been able to discover who I am and the type of work that I do. Um, the latter. And in Mm -hmm. fact, about a year ago, exactly a year ago, I had a big licensing meeting with a deal that I eventually walked away from, but a big licensing meeting in New York And it was to license designs for fabric and home goods. Um, And I met with director of marketing, the CFO, um, the COO and the CEO. And the CEO looked at my fabric and he's like, this is really nice. This is great. And he's a, he was a a man of a certain age. He must've been in his mid to late sixties. And then I pulled out my book and I said, I also wrote a book and he stopped and he said, you wrote a book. (laughs) (laughs) He opened the book and he just very slowly flipped the pages. And like, this is a man who works in fabric. He knows what he's been, he's doing. He's been working in this industry for 40 years. And he was somewhat impressed by my fabric collection and by my designs, but he was most impressed by the fact that I'd written a book. And so certainly I think the thing about a book is that it requires so much work and it requires so much project management. You're especially with craft, you're dealing with so many different moving parts. You have to create the projects, you have to write tutorials, you have to manage um, photography, you're dealing with the art director, the publisher, you're helping with publicity. Like being able to do all of those things is actually a really good skill to have. And having a book as a tangible result and saying, I helped to create this or I created this goes a long way in certain circles, Mm -hmm. especially people who don't understand blogging. They don't understand social media. Um, If you're dealing with retail, a lot of times it's people who like they're still working in the world like it was 20 years ago. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the cachet of having a book can't can't be beat. It really can't. It's not a lot of money. Like I have not even gotten, I got an advance, but I haven't seen any royalties on my first book yet. But being able to say that I created that Mm -hmm. opens a lot of doors. But yeah, so let me just, I've been chewing your, you know, ears off. Let me go into some wrap up questions. Mm -hmm. So first question is, how do you stay organized? So you got like a lot of stuff going, like you're writing a book, you've written a book in the past, you you do classes, you have a shop that you run. Like, 
How do you stay sane? Oh, boy. Um, That's one of the benefits of having, one, worked in education for a number of years, and two, having had regular jobs as well as being a consultant, is you just learn how to keep yourself organized because um, you have to. So I recently started um, using a method that my best friend Lisa Congdon teaches on, I think it's Creative Live, and it's time management for creative people. Um, and I do, I do an Excel spreadsheet of all my projects and all the deliverables. Um, and then I look at it every single week and figure out what needs to be done next. And then usually on Friday night or Sunday night, I write out all the things I need to do the following week. And then I plan out my Monday so that, Mm. On Monday, I'm good to go, and I know what I'm doing that day. Um, and then from Monday on, or from Tuesday on, I just do my to-do list every single day. And then I go and update my Excel spreadsheet, and I note what I've done and what I haven't done um, and change any dates as I need to. And it's really helpful when I get new projects or inquiries where I can just go to that Excel spreadsheet and see whether or not I can actually squeeze another thing in. Um I also have a cash flow that I do for each month. And so sometimes I will be completely booked for a certain month, but no money is coming in because, you know, some clients don't pay for 30 days. Mm. So I will often just add something into that month, knowing that I'll be crazy busy for that month, but I need, I need a project that will pay me now. (laughs) So it's helpful to have a bunch of different planning tools that all kind of speak to the same thing, which is like trading my time and what do I use my time for and how much money am I getting in for that time? Um, but that's been, those two tools have been super, super helpful. And Lisa's class, even though I've known Lisa for, I don't know, eight years were BFFs. Like I finally took her class and it it really revolutionized (laughs) how I work. (laughs) Oh, wow. (laughs) I mean, because it's like once I always tell people, like once you have a system and, you know, processes and systems in place, it completely changes the game. Like Mm -hmm. you're able to get more done. You have more free time to do other things. But just having that system and process in place, I feel like it's key because I always say time is money, you know, (laughs) It is absolutely money. And when you start to see like, oh, I have an extra half hour in this day that I didn't block out. It's like, oh, well, what can I do with that extra half hour? I can draw for half an hour. Like, that's no problem. You know, there are all these things I can do with an extra half an hour, an hour. And so that's really where all the fun projects happen. (laughs) They happen in the cracks that you just had been overlooking because you weren't organized. Right. (laughs) And then the next question is, do you have a hobby? So I know like, of course, you you already do some creative things, but sometimes people like I find out they sing on the side or they're like a dancer or they like reading books. So curious, do you have kind of like a hobby that you do when you're not doing all the things? Yes. Um, although people seem to think it's what I do for a living, but I, I sew. So I mm. sew clothing. Um, and now I've, I've just recently started making quilts, but Sewing my own clothing is a really wonderful hobby for me. It allows me to work with fabric. Um, It allows me to make clothes because I love clothes. I love, love, love (laughs) clothes. But I'm also fairly frugal. So, um, I mean, granted, fabric is not cheap. But, you know, if if I had another hobby that required me to go out and spend money, I'd probably spend more money. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But no, I, I sew a lot of my own clothes. I don't sell anything I sew, um, because it's too labor intensive. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's really just something I do for myself and I love it. Perfect. And then the last question, easiest question of the night is where can people find you? Please let them know your social media handles, your website, and anything else you'd like them to know about you. Yeah. So I'm on Instagram probably the most. Um, and that's, Jen Hewitt. So it's J E N H E W E T T. Um, and I post there not every day anymore, a couple times a week. And I also have a website, which is just jenhewitt.com. Um, and that links to my classes and my, what else? Um, my shop 
And my shop is currently on Etsy, but that will be moving towards the end of the year. So um, my website and Instagram are both good homes for all of my work. Ah, Perfect. Well, thanks, Jen. I appreciate you coming on to the podcast. Oh, thank you for the delightful conversation. Oh, my goodness. Jen delivered just gold, right? There were so many great, many conversations in this episode that I really enjoyed, and I hope you guys did too. Please let us know your thoughts on social. Shoot me an email. And if you think this will help someone else who needs it right now, please share it with them. I just wanted to point out just a couple, couple of things that she said. One, comparison is the thief of joy. Every single time, people, it will get you. If you continue to compare yourself to others, you will always feel like you are less than. It takes some work sometimes in order to like figure out how to avoid doing that. But trust me, you have to do it or you will never be able to get ahead. Okay. And then the other thing about the book proposal, I I thought she gave some great tips, making sure you have a viable idea, make sure that you can actually do what you're saying you could do, which is carry the idea through to the end and think about the proposal and create a good, compelling proposal that will really um, get people excited about possibly picking up your book. And then last but not least, I just wanted to mention the passion projects, folks, I mean, you know, I've had several examples of people coming on who talk about how a passion project just led into something bigger. And and not all passion projects do, but you just never know uh, if one might catch fire. So if you're thinking about doing one, just do it. And don't put the pressure of like having it become something onto the project. Just do it because you love it, okay? And if you want to hear more about passion projects and how they've worked, check out episode 83 on the podcast. Um, it's entitled How Passion Projects Can Lead to Opportunities. I'm, I'm really a big fan of passion projects and I, and I do think they are a great way to put yourself out there, not just to start a career, but just to challenge yourself to do something new and actually stick with it. Okay, so that's all I've got, people. Of course, for show notes for this page, head on over to nishaysnow.com slash 95. Also over there, you could get the Life Cleanse Journal. You could uh, get the course on how to organize your life to make time for your passion. And you can get a ton of like little freebies here and there. I have it where you can sign up for the newsletter list and get some goodies. All right. Until next week, which I, of course, will bring you another amazing guest. Have a great and productive week. Take care, y'all. Bye. Bye.